I'm so glad to be back here at RPTS. I graduated from RPTS in 2017. And actually, after my graduation, there was one reality that disturbed me a lot. That is, my best, my, the sermons I preached at chapel here were much better than what I preached anywhere else. So I, I was really struggling with this fact. I was wondering, it couldn't be God's will that I give my best preaching here, but not in real ministry. But then I realized the answer. Actually, the answer underlying this fact is not me, but you. Because there could be no better audience who is more attentive to the preaching of God's word, who is more eager to hear God's word, who is more convinced of the power of God. And for this reason, even when I'm preaching, I know that I am fully supported and empowered by your silent prayers and by your eagerness. And for this reason, I am so eager to be here because as a newly ordained pastor, I need to be stirred up by you through my uh, ministry to you here today as much, I, as much as I am eager to stir you up by my preaching. So our text today is 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. 1 Kings 19, 9 through 18. This is actually a familiar passage. There's the well-known phrase, a still small voice that God spoke to Elijah after he had enjoyed a tremendous victory on Mount Carmel, followed by a regrettable flee into wilderness and to Mount Horeb. And so now please pay attention to the reading of God's word. There Elijah came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, threw down your orders, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your orders, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint, you shall anoint, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Israel. And Jehu, the son of Nemeshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Maholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, or the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Grass and flowers wither, Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of our God abides forever. Together we say amen. So seven years ago, 
when I started attending RPTS. I plan to, I didn't plan to linger here for too long. I plan to spend only one year and then transfer to another seminary. Why? Because this seminary was too small for me. The size and fame of RPTS didn't match my big dreams. But my plan changed. So one year became two years, and two years extended to three years. And I was very re reluctant to leave this place when I had to graduate. So why such a change of mind? Because at this small seminary, I learned the greatness of the God whom I desire to serve. And when Elijah entered into his ministry, he had a big zeal, and he had a big dreams. He believed that the greatness of God could only be manifested by tremendous, by extraordinary means, and by miraculous victories. And he did achieve certain degree of success in his ministry. But in this passage, God decided to show Elijah his greatness in a different way, in a most unexpected way. So he appeared to Elijah in the sound of a low whisper. And the better known translation of this phrase is a still, small voice. And it's this still, small voice that we all focus on in our passage today. So first, how did this small, still voice come to Elijah? It came to Elijah when he was hiding in a cave, defeated and distressed, as verse 9 tells us. It didn't come when the great prophet was confronting and conquering the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, the high point of his ministry. But it came to Elijah when he was reduced to a poor and lowly man in a cave on Mount Horeb. And even more significantly, this small voice came after the most terrifying and powerful signs. First, there was a great and strong wind tearing the mountains and smashing the rocks. Then there was an earthquake, casting the earth to melt, causing the earth to melt like wax and the mountains to skip like ramps. And then there was a fire, a consuming fire, so that the whole mountain was wrapped in smoke and the, the air filled with the smell of sulfur. The Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, the sound of a low whisper, a still, small voice came after a dreadful uproar. So what is this voice like? The Hebrew phrase that describes this voice is composed of three words, two nouns and one adjective. The two nouns are actually two contradictory items, ko, ko and damama. Ko means voice, and damama means silence. And the adjective is to modify this awkward combination, and the adjective is thing. Thing. So the whole phrase is literally translated as a thing, voice, and silence. For the volume is so low and the distinction so subtle that you can't tell even whether it's a voice or a silence. It's a voice that is infinitely thing, and it's a silence that is clearly audible. And God is using this still, small voice to show Elijah that his greatness, 
doesn't depend on the greatness of outward means. Yes, he can certainly use the wind, the storm, the earthquake, the fire to manifest his greatness, as he did in the past. But here, we see that God is also free to choose the most unnoticeable sign, the most insignificant means, even a still small voice to demonstrate his greatness, even a greater greatness. A greatness that is independent of outdoor means and circumstance. A greatness that centers on God himself. So there's nothing actually mystical about this still small voice. There's nothing special about this stillness. But, it, but it's the greatness of God that is the central message of this passage. And it's the greatness of God that Elijah was invited to behold and experience. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a world of turmoil. Nations are raging, and our enemies are roaring. But are you paying attention to the still, small voice of God? And here I'm speaking of the voice from the pulpit, I'm speaking of the voice that comes from the preacher, the regular preaching of the gospel. And it doesn't matter who is preaching. It doesn't matter how many people are listening. But as long as the preacher is faithfully opening up the word of God, his preaching is the word of God. His preaching is a voice from heaven. And he's and in this voice, no matter how small, how feeble it is, there's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the word wants to silence this voice. The one wants people to think there's no power in preaching. But you shall not be deceived and lose your heart and lose your faith in the word of God. But I'm speaking of an even smaller voice. That is the voice from the closet. That is the voice that most people will not be able to hear from your mouth. But this is the, same, this is the voice that carries the same power. This is the voice that is able to turn the world upside down. And I can share how I came to realize that the turning point of ministry is when I realized that how important, how prayer, how powerful prayer can be. Prayer makes a big difference. And sometimes I need to know that it's better for me to go into my closet to pray to God than to go out and run and labor by my own strength. So brothers and sisters, pray. Pray without ceasing. And God will use your little, small voice to do far more abundantly than what you can think or ask. So God showed his greatness to Elijah in this small, still voice. And Elijah had heard it, but how did he respond? At the first sight, he seemed very moved by this voice. He recognized God's presence in it. And he came out of the cave with his faith wrapped with his cloak. But when God asked him the same question, what are you doing here, Elijah? He gave the same answer. In verse 14, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your orders, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take away. This is the exact same answer he gave in verse 10. So still, Elijah didn't get it. Still, Elijah insisted on his own zeal and complained about his circumstance. Still, he was disappointed that God didn't intervene as he had expected. 
Clearly, he needed a second lesson. So in verses 15 to 18, God spoke to him again, and this time God commissioned him to anoint Hazel, Jehu, and Elisha. And it's important for us to notice that God is not switching gears here, but he is impressing the same lesson on Elijah, only in a different way. Look at verse 17. The one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. And this successive arrangement should remind us of the previous setting in verse 11 and 12. After the wind, an earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. And we may even go as far as to compel Hazel, Jehu, and Elisha to the wind, earthquake, and a fire. For Hazel was indeed like a strong wind which shall sweep across Israel, striking down their young men and dashing pieces their babies. And Jehu was very much like an earthquake which shall overthrow the house of Ahab and demolish the altars of Baal. And we may say Elisha was just like the purifying fire that came from God, which shall purge Israel of their idolatry. But Hazel is not the center of God's plan, nor is Jehu, nor is Elisha. They are just the background set up for the true subject, which is revealed in verse 18. The last verse of our passage. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that have not kissed him. These 7,000 in Israel, a small remnant indeed, is the actual focus of God's plan of redemption at the very means which God chose to reveal his greatness. And just as God has revealed his greatness in a still, small voice, so now he reveals his greatness again in this hidden, small remnant. So God is telling Elijah to recognize his greatness, even in small things, even in things that seem to disappoint him. And the brothers and sisters, are you discouraged by the fact that the church is declining in the United States? Are you, do you feel that Christians are more and more becoming like a small remnant in this land that used to proclaim the word of God, that used to enjoy such great blessings at the Great Awakening? And most likely when you leave seminary, when you enter into your ministry, you will start with a very small congregation, if you decide to plant a church, you might just start with a few group of people. So are you discouraged by this fact? I came from China, and I'm always amazed by the rapid growth of the churches in China, in my home country. But how did it start? Yes, we are greatly indebted to the missionaries who have labored in China for two centuries. We are honored to have such great men as Hudson Taylor and Eric Litter, who are indeed the giants of faith in the history of missions. But after the golden days of mission works came World War II, and the Jap Japanese army invaded China. And after World War II came the Civil War, and the Communist Party came to power. Then persecution started, missionaries were deported, and the pastors were imprisoned. But how did the seed of faith survive the war wind, survive the earthquake, survive the fire, preserved for this joyful day of harvest? by those illiterate women who lived in small villages. 
They were so insignificant that the government didn't bother to put them into prison. And they were so stubborn that their husbands couldn't force them to abandon their faith. And they preached to their children, to their neighbors, the crudest version of the gospel which they had learned by heart and practiced in life. And the people believed. People hold fast to what they shared. And that is why the church in China is prospering today. So in this way, by this small remnant who speaks a little small voice, that God has manifested his greatness, that God has advanced his kingdom, that God has established his church, which the wind shall not blow down, which the earthquake shall not shake down, which the fire shall not burn down. Indeed, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, brothers and sisters, so let none of you despise the small things that come from God. For you have no idea how God can use the small things which may appear in your eyes today to make you become the great things more than you can imagine. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, we thank you, and we pray that you will make us faithful in small things, that you will keep us expecting great things even in this day of small things. And Lord, we do look forward to the great day of our Lord Jesus Christ, when every knee shall bow down before him in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. O oh God, to you be glory forever, now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.